Alvin Karpis was a Depression-era gangster who literally shot to fame as co-leader of the trigger-happy Barker Karpis gang in 1930s America. Known as Creepy due to his sinister smile and Ray to his fellow gang members, Karpis was one of only four men ever to be dubbed Public Enemy Number One. And he was the only one who was taken alive. He also had the distinction of being the longest-serving prisoner in Alcatraz. In later life, he came back into the public eye, partly due to a bizarre connection to Charles Manson. Carpus was born in Montreal in 1907 to Lithuanian immigrant parents, but was raised in Topeka, Kansas. He started in crime age 10, selling pornography and associating with gamblers, bootleggers and pimps. By 1926, Carpus had received a 10-year sentence at a Kansas State Reformatory. He promptly escaped with his new partner in crime, Lawrence Duvall. Embarking on a year-long crime spree that was only interrupted by Duvall's recapture, Carpus was himself eventually apprehended whilst attempting to steal a car. Landing this time in Kansas State Penitentiary, he met Fred Barker, leader of the Bloody Barkers gang, as they had been dubbed in the newspapers. A new alliance was formed. Fred's brothers, Herman, Lloyd and Doc, had previously completed the gang, but Herman had killed himself after a shootout. Doc was doing life for a murder in 1920, and Lloyd got 25 years in 1922 for mail theft. Only the infamous Ma Barker was left on the outside, although her involvement in criminality was a media myth. She limited herself to organising publicity and lobbying campaigns that pestered politicians and parole boards for her son's release. In his memoirs, Alvin wrote, Ma was always somebody in our lives, somebody we looked after and took with us when we moved city to city, hideout to hideout. She just didn't have the know-how to direct us on a robbery, and we always made it a point of only discussing our scores when Ma wasn't around. Upon Carpus' release in 1931, he joined up with Fred, and they also released Doc, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They put together the gang, and immediately got to work. On December the 19th, 1931, Carpus and Fred Barker killed Sheriff C. Roy Kelly, who was investigating their robbery of a store in West Plains, Missouri. The gang fled to St. Paul, Minnesota. Laying low till 1933, they then kidnapped William Ham, a millionaire Minnesota brewer, releasing him after a $100,000 ransom was paid. They then abducted St. Paul banker Edward Brenner, this time receiving a $200,000 ransom for his release. However, Brenner's father was a friend of President Roosevelt, who applied pressure to J. Edgar Hoover for the FBI to show results. Hoover created so-called flying squads of the best FBI agents, tasked with hunting down the leading public enemies. In 1934, they closed the book on a host of notorious criminals, resulting in the deaths of John Dillinger and Babyface Nelson, among others. The FBI flying squads knocked off Ma and Fred Barker in a shootout on January the 16th, 1935, then located Carpus in Atlantic City shortly afterwards. Carpus and an accomplice shot their way out, though Carpus' pregnant girlfriend was hit by a stray bullet. She survived and successfully delivered Alvin's child while he was on the run. There's lots more to come in this video. But please consider subscribing, and please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. Carpus continued on a crime wave that included a rare train robbery that netted him $27,000.
he was even rumoured to have sent a death threat to Hoover, though in his memoirs he dismissed this as a publicity invention by the FBI. On the 1st of May 1936, Carpus was again located by the FBI, this time in New Orleans. Hoover flew in, wanting to personally make the arrest. Shortly after 5 p.m. on the 2nd of May, as a dozen or so agents swarmed Carpus' car, Hoover announced to Carpus that he was under arrest, grabbing his arm before he could reach a rifle in the back seat. At least, this was the FBI version, putting Hoover in a heroic light. In his memoirs, Carpus' version was much different. He stated that Hoover only approached the car for his glory moment, after he had been given the all-clear, and further pointed out that his car didn't have a back seat. Whatever the truth of the matter, the arrest was a major moment, signalling the end of the big-name Depression-era criminal. Brought to trial at St. Paul Federal Courts Building, Carpus initially pleaded not guilty. Two weeks later, he offered through his attorney, Thomas Newman, to plead guilty to a charge of conspiracy in the Brenner kidnapping if kidnapping charges were dropped. The court accepted the offer. Sentenced to life imprisonment, Carpus was an early prisoner at the recently constructed Alcatraz. He was held there from August 1936 to April 1962 and was Alcatraz's longest-serving inmate. When the institution was closed, he was moved to McNeil Island Penitentiary in Washington State, and it was there that he would encounter a young convict named Charles Manson. In his autobiography, Carpus wrote of Manson, This kid approaches me to request music lessons. He wants to learn guitar and become a music star. Little Charlie's so lazy and shiftless, I doubt if he'll put in the time required to learn. The youngster's been in institutions all his life. His mother was a prostitute and was never around to look after him. I decided it's time someone did something for him, and to my surprise, he learns quickly. He has a pleasant voice and a pleasing personality, although he's unusually meek and mild for a convict. He never has a harsh word to say. He's never even involved in an argument. After the successful lessons, Manson asked Carpus for an inn at a nightclub or casino in Las Vegas, where Alvin had contacts, but Carpus declined. Manson left with the promise that he would be bigger than the Beatles. Neither Carpus nor anyone else could have imagined that Manson's fame would ultimately be derived from something much more sinister than music. Finally released in 1969, Carpus was deported to Canada. He was initially refused entry, having had his fingerprints removed by underworld physician Joseph Moran in 1934. Settling in Montreal, he wrote his memoirs in 1971, entitled Public Enemy No. 1, which he updated in 1980. The topical association with Manson garnered him much extra attention, and his book tours across Canada drew great interest. He moved to Spain in 1973. Then in 1979, his life ended in suitably mysterious fashion. Found dead with sleeping pills next to him, the situation was initially ruled a suicide, only to be reversed to natural causes after a perfunctory re-examination of the scene. Some still suspected foul play, but unlikely as this seems, it will never be confirmed, as he was buried next day without an autopsy. Regardless, he had defied the overwhelming odds of his violent life and been one of the last men standing from the time of the Depression-era outlaw. While Lord Haw Haw and his fellow travellers were betraying their countries over the airwaves from inside Nazi Germany, 
Occupied France had its own radio superstar, broadcasting on behalf of the Third Reich. Nicknamed the French Goebbels, Philippe Henriot's mesmerizing rhetoric and delivery made him compulsory listening for friends and foes alike, and his career is a timely reminder of the dangers of state propaganda. Henriot's life between the wars didn't immediately suggest that he would become a Nazi collaborator. He was a poet and journalist. The driving force in his life was devotion to Roman Catholicism. Like many Catholics, Henriot felt deeply threatened by the rise of communism. His opposition to the far left led to him becoming politically active in the Republican Federation. The Federation was the largest conservative party during the French Third Republic, France's system of government from 1870 until the country's fall to the Nazis in 1940. The organization gathered together the so-called progressive Orleanists of the right in opposing the more secular and centrist Democratic Alliance. Henriot was elected to the Third Republic's Chamber of Deputies for the Gironde Department, located in southwest France, in 1932 and 1936. As the Spanish Civil War polarized Europe, so Henriot drifted further right. In his speeches, his anti-communism sat alongside increasing hostility to Jews and Freemasons, Whilst this may have suggested that he was by now a fellow traveller of the Nazis, at the outbreak of war, he was fiercely anti-German. As Paris fell, the French government retreated to Vichy in southern France and signed an armistice with the Third Reich. The Vichy regime is often characterised as a puppet Nazi government. However, it was conceived as a pragmatic and expedient way for the French to retain some control over French society. Vichy was a devil's bargain. Two million French soldiers had been retained as forced labour by the Nazis and held over the head of the Vichy government. French police were forced to round up Jews and communists, many of whom perished. In return, Vichy was largely allowed to plough its own furrow, in its own zone, and in the French overseas colonies. They also managed to resist committing troops, or military support, to Axis operations. Henriot began working for the Vichy regime as a journalist, still focusing principally on defending Catholicism. Things changed when the Nazis invaded Soviet Russia, in Henriot's mind, the defeat of Bolshevism would once and for all secure Catholicism against the godless left. He swung squarely behind the Nazis. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing to the channel. And please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. Thank you. Henriot's work for Vichy consisted of creating programs for, and broadcasting on, Radio Paris, which promoted the position of the government. He then took to broadcasting twice a day on Radio Vichy, instigating a propaganda campaign against the Free French Forces, the resistance within France, and anyone else that he saw as a threat. He also attempted to inspire Catholics in what he regarded as a life-or-death struggle against Bolshevism. His arguments that Nazi occupation wasn't so bad after all managed to find a receptive audience among some, leading him to receive that nickname, the French Goebbels. In 1942, Allied success in North Africa threatened the Vichy regime forcing the Nazis to extend their military occupation over southern France. Henriot continued to broadcast propaganda. Indeed, his profile and audience continued to grow. Huge and diverse groups of people, some of whom had little time for his opinions, listened in compulsively. At the time, he was probably France's biggest media star. 
his broadcasts, even seemed to fire himself up. In 1943, despite being in his 50s, he joined the Malice, the Vichy government's paramilitary militia. As an iconic figure in Vichy circles, Henriot was always a prime target for the French resistance. Yet such an operation, in the heart of collaborationist France, would be a bold one. On the 28th of June 1944, Henriot opened his door to members of the Malice, except that they were in fact members of the Maquis, the Vichy-based arm of the French resistance, disguised in Malice uniforms. Henriot never stood a chance. What followed might seem odd to a modern audience. Henriot received a state funeral in Paris, presided over by the Archbishop of the city. Thousands attended, and filed past his coffin to pay respects. Paris was liberated less than two months later, and everyone that day must have known that it was only a matter of when, not if, the Allies would roll into the city. There's no doubt that many saw Henriot as a French patriot, doing what he could to preserve French culture and Catholicism. For others, just like today, fame and celebrity can have a mesmerizing effect on people, and there will always be professional mourners. What is more unsettling is the realization that in any era, skillful propaganda can blind most people to the moral bankruptcy of tyrants. First, a brief reference to the history of the Nazi party. As the infamous Hermann Goering awaited his fate at the Nuremberg trial, behind the scenes, another Goering, his younger brother Albert, was fighting for his freedom. The amazing story of Albert Goering would take decades to emerge, and he would die ignominiously before it did. Albert Goering was born on the 9th of March 1895 near Berlin, the fifth child of Heinrich Ernst Goering, the former Reich's Commissar to German Southwest Africa and German Consul General to Haiti. The Goerings were related to aristocracy, including the Zeppelins of airship fame and the Merck family, founders of the pharmaceutical giant that bears their name. The Goering family lived with their children's aristocratic godfather of Jewish heritage, Ritter Hermann von Eppenstein, in his Veldenstein and Mautendorf castles. Von Eppenstein acted as a surrogate father to the children, as their biological father was often away. Like his brother, Albert served in the First World War as a signal engineer in the German army. Following the conflict, Albert became something of a bon vivant, with a dilettante career as a filmmaker. When the Nazis ascended to power, with his brother at the very top of the party, it seemed that Albert was set fair. However, he despised the Nazis, regarding them as brutes. He quietly, and sometimes very publicly, intervened on behalf of people in the crosshairs of Nazi tyranny. Stories abounded of Albert intervening in the street, where lower-level Nazi officers were mistreating citizens, often Jews. The officers in charge were immediately cowed when they discovered who he was. When Albert's former boss, Oskar Pitzer, was arrested by the Nazis, Goering used his influence to have him freed, then further assisted Pitzer and his family in escaping from Germany. At the time of the Anschluss, or Union, between Austria and Germany, Albert was based near Vienna. He set about exhaustively trying to arrange exit visas for as many of his Jewish friends as he could. He also managed to convince his reluctant brother to have Archduke Joseph Ferdinand of Austria, the last remaining Habsburg prince, released from the Dachau concentration camp. After the outbreak of war, Albert was appointed export director of the Skoda Works in occupied Czechoslovakia. In Prague, he was brazenly subversive, 
forging his brother's signature to have dissidents released, and requesting labour from concentration camps, then releasing them as soon as they arrived. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider liking, subscribing to the channel, and sharing. And please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. Yet no matter what he did, Herman was always loyal to him, and constantly used his clout to pull Albert out of the fire. Four times he squashed arrest warrants. In 1944, there was a shoot on sight order from the SS in Prague against Albert. Herman stuck his neck out again but this time informed Albert that this would be the last time. The brotherly love was understandable, but Hermann Goering's actions have also led some to consider reappraising parts of Hermann's reputation. Specifically, could the man who jump-started the Holocaust by sending a memo to Reinhard Heydrich requesting a plan for extermination be less anti-Semitic than previously assumed? Hermann Goering certainly had no problem sparing Jews that his brother asked him to. He often did so merely for financial gain, or to add to his world-renowned art collection. Despite signing the infamous memo, he played no active part in the Holocaust, and may have signed the order simply because Hitler didn't want his name on it. By 1942, following his defeat by the RAF in the Battle of Britain, and his failure to prevent Allied bombing of Germany, he was completely sidelined. He spent the remainder of the war brooding in his castles and villas, Hitler's deputy in name only. At best, Hermann Goering was ambivalent toward the fate of the Jews, with Albert as his occasional conscience. Albert was detained after the end of the war, purely for being Hermann's brother. The two men met for the last time in May 1945 at a transit jail in Augsburg. Hermann apologised to Albert for putting him in a difficult position. The Allies at the Nuremberg Tribunal refused to believe that Albert was part of the resistance to Nazism until 34 prominent people came forward with their stories of how Albert had saved them. But things would not improve when he gained his freedom. He was shunned in Germany and found it almost impossible to find work. Depression, alcoholism and divorce followed. Living in a small flat on a state pension, his last years were far removed from the splendour of his earlier life. On the 20th of December 1966, he died penniless and a pariah, without any public recognition of the part he played in saving hundreds of innocent lives. Francis Tumblety was by any measure an extraordinary character. An eccentric self-promoter and quack doctor who became something of a celebrity during his lifetime. He was no stranger to adventure. Then, Nearly a century after his death, two police historians, Stuart Evans and Paul Ganey, discovered a letter that catapulted the long-forgotten Tumblety to the top of the Jack the Ripper suspect list. What is the case against him? Was he a man capable of carrying out the infamous crimes? The letter implicating him was written in 1913 by DCI John Littlechild, who had been a high-ranking officer at the time of the murders. Naming Tumblety as a very likely suspect, it gave few clues about police interest in him, but set Evans and Ganey on the trail of a fascinating new development in the Ripper story. Not much is known about Tumblety's early life, though it's believed he was born in Ireland and taken to the US at an early age. Setting himself up as a doctor, he marketed a number of so-called medicines, which were nothing more than snake oils. He found fortune travelling the length and breadth of North America, 
but controversy was always hot on his heels, as when a patient of his died in Boston, though he escaped prosecution. His continual use of aliases landed him in serious trouble in May 1865, when he was mistaken for a co-conspirator in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. He only gained his freedom when he was able to prove his true identity. Ironically, Tumblety, who was a pathological name-dropper, had constantly told people he was a close friend of Lincoln. Tumblety was also a thief, as well as a conman. His lack of empathy for the marks he swindled can be an indication of psychopathy, though it's a misconception that all psychopaths are violent. By the 1880s, Tumblety was also travelling widely in Europe. He was a Fenian, or Irish Republican, sympathiser, with connections to that movement in Britain and Ireland, which explained his regular visits. In June 1888, on the eve of the murders, Tumblety arrived in Liverpool. At some stage, he went to London, because he was arrested there on the 7th of November 1888 by the Metropolitan Police for engaging in a homosexual encounter. He was bailed, then abruptly rearrested on the 14th, and rebailed on the 16th. Where was he during the summer of murder and mayhem in Whitechapel? And why was he rearrested? There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider liking, subscribing to the channel, and sharing. And please consider supporting my work with a PayPal donation. The link is in the description. Thank you. Evans and Ganey also uncovered a story about the so-called Batty Street Lodger. The mysterious lodger was described as an American man, tall and moustached, who had supposedly left bloodstained clothes behind upon fleeing the lodging house the night after the double event murders. Newspaper reports of the time said the man had previously been in Liverpool and that he had been seen acting suspiciously and approaching prostitutes in the area. It could have been Tumblety. The police apparently thought so, seeming to connect the dots between Tumblety and the Batty Street Lodger. Their re-arrest of the American prompted him to jump bail. The bail figure was not an inconsiderable amount. £300 then is the equivalent of £34,000 today. It must have been a serious new line of inquiry. Otherwise, why wouldn't he have jumped bail in the first place? Tumblety fled via France to the US, using the name Frank Townsend. Now began perhaps the most extraordinary part of the story, and it seems amazing that it took a century to come to light. Scotland Yard sent Inspector Andrews to New York. They never admitted that they were on the trail of Tumblety, yet the New York police had been alerted and placed Tumblety under surveillance at a rooming house after he arrived. The media had been alerted too, and dozens of articles appeared in newspapers, openly speculating that Tumblety was the Ripper, creating a fever pitch in the city. Yet in British newspapers of the time, it's as though none of it ever happened. So what is the evidence for and against? First of all, Tumblety was a deeply unsavoury character. He was also said to have a deep hatred of women and prostitutes, and to have had a collection of female body parts. This information was gleaned from an account of a man who supposedly attended a dinner party hosted by Tumblety. However, the man responsible for the account, C.S. Dunham, was said to be a dubious character, whose account only surfaced after the New York media frenzy. Tumblety can be definitively placed in London at the time of at least some of the murders, and not definitively ruled out for the others. This would be especially noteworthy if he was indeed the Batty Street Lodger. 
Researchers have dismissed Tumblety as being too old and having far too noticeable a moustache to match the descriptions of the Ripper. Yet contemporary accounts noted his youthful appearance and a quite different moustache to the one that he sported in famous photographs. His re-arrest on an obviously more serious basis would seem to suggest that the police suspected him of the Ripper murders, but Tumblety was a committed Fenian, and rumours were rife at the time of Fenian plots to assassinate leading British politicians. This could readily explain both the re-arrest and the flight from justice. Intriguingly, the murders ceased when he fled, but they didn't restart in the US once he went there, at least not as far as we know, and Jack the Ripper was a killer unable to resist his impulses rather than a calculating spree killer. Tumblety was homosexual. It would be highly unusual for killers of that type to target anyone other than men, unless he was bisexual. Tumblety died in 1903. In the little child letter, he referred to the existence of a large file on Tumblety, probably related to his Fenian activities, but perhaps with a section on their suspicions that he was Jack the Ripper. Frustratingly, the file was lost, so we'll never know. In a final twist, when Tumblety's estate was wound up, amongst his otherwise expensive possessions were two cheap imitation rings, just like those that had been taken from Annie Chapman, the second victim of Jack the Ripper.